What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gym Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, what's going on? Uh, I survived Morbius, Pablo. Oh, man. I am not going to watch this film, but I'm, I've been looking I've been looking forward to your review more than I have the movie. <laughs> We're going to be talking about some Morbius. Brian was like, yo, we got to talk about Picard, Paramount making moves. Netflix, Marvel shows are seemingly confirmed to be canon. And we're going to discuss that and see how, and see what this means, and what we'll see. Um, and the possibilities, there's rumors out there that, you know, there's some characters that are going to be showing up in the Echo series. Uh, Sam Raimi is down to Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. Brian, I don't, it doesn't make me think twice of them, like, and and it doesn't it doesn't give me the that 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 moment of pondering the the possibility, right? It's like it's an afterthought for me, you know. Um, it shouldn't be a do over, but anyway, Doctor Strange. We got the runtime: two hours and six minutes. Some people are saying that that's right. That's that's a good time, and some people are saying that's a bit too short for what we expect to be a cameo fest. And me and you, Brian, I've said it before, this stuff has to make sense. If they're just there just to hooray and then move on to the next hooray, or it's not gonna, it's not gonna work for a lot of people out there. Thor Love and Thunder and, you know, Chris Hemsworth is out making press tours already. So we, we're, we're soon gonna be getting uh, a trailer and I have from my one of my sources who has come through in the past says something to me that I'm going to announce to you that you probably have not heard but you have probably thought about it because it makes sense but this is a possible confirmation it, I feel like it is a confirmation um as we've been talking about in the in the last episode regarding Ezra Miller, WB is reevaluating that situation. What does that mean, Brian? Does it mean everything we said it would have to be? I think so. Let's see. Let's see. Um, and some other stuff going on in the WB, man. Hey, what did you say, Brian, to me in your text? If you ever saw 48 Hours, the most one of the most memorable lines. There's a new sheriff in town. Um, Star Wars. We have some updates regarding their future project. There's going to be some... What, what, what event is this, Brian? Lucasfilms is uh, having? Yeah, it's, it's a Star Wars dedicated event, and it is happening the day before Obi-Wan drops. The day before Obi-Wan drops. Interesting. And there's going to be some surprises, apparently, in Kenobi. And then we're going to talk about Moon Knight, man. Moon Knight, the second episode. Um, we'll get into a little bit of deeper discussion. I don't want to give away anything now because I don't want it to lead into other stuff. But let's start off with Brian's spoiler reviews because who cares? <laughs> Brian, what was your review? All right, spoiler alert's been given. So first off, my first spoiler, it's not a spoiler. <laughs> this movie's not going to make money. Let me tell you why. So, okay. But, 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 but Brian, people out there are like, oh, it made 39 million. We didn't think it was going to make this much money. The over-under for me this weekend is 15. 15. That's my prediction. 60% drop from a 39. And by the way, that 39 compared to Venom, which was... 90 compared to the Batman at 130. 39 is terrible for a yeah. movie of this type. 
Yeah. So I went. It was a weekday, kind of late afternoon matinee. Pablo, I was the only person in the theater. Wow. This movie has been out That's... for less than a week. <laughs> I had my feet up on the seat next to me, I was double reclined. I was like, you know what? Oh, popcorn. Like pushing my button like 10 times just to see what would happen. <laughs> I was the only person there. Oh my God, that's, that's sad. I wish I could have been there just to take a picture. Go ahead. The movie, you know, I think it says something, here's what I would say. It says something good about the genre that this movie's getting panned, and here's why. Because a big part of its failure is its lack of imagination. This, you, you don't need to see this movie to see this movie, if that makes sense. Because you already know all the beats, all the cliches, all the turns and twists it's gonna take. Like, you have a character with a disability, a lifelong disability, so where do we start? We start with his childhood and his struggle with the disability. And oh, he has a best friend who also has a disability. Hint, they don't stay friends because they never <laughs> stay friends, right? And then you fast forward, he finds the cure. And the cure is controversial. It's illegal. It causes him to become an outsider, even though he's the brilliant scientist. And of course, then the experiment that fixes him goes wrong. And, and he kind of has re kind of buyer's remorse for having cured himself. Yeah. Which then leads to his best friend wants the same cure, doesn't give it to him, splits bill for them. Best friend gets the cure anyway. Now you've got the good ah. vampire versus yeah. the bad vampire. You've got the love interest caught in the middle. Set pieces and credits. It, it is that's the number one failing is that this movie didn't break any new ground in trying to introduce this character. And I think we've gotten to a point in this genre where that's just not good enough anymore. Like I actually yeah. watched this movie and I was like, you know, if this movie had come out around the time or soon after when like original Blade or original X Men was coming out, I actually think this movie would have been better received. Because at least back then, it would have been like, well, we haven't really seen this kind of film before with this kind yeah. of anti-hero. But now, it, the bar has been raised so high that this falls way short. I think the second, the second thing, I was trying to, in my head, also contextualize, like, why, why does Venom work with so many people? And this clearly doesn't. And I think what I settled on is that Tom Hardy plays... Eddie Brock and Venom, like it's over the top, but it's like over the top in entertaining. Kind of charis yeah, it's like a charismatic, comedic, entertaining way that for a lot of people that alone that works. just propels, you know, and it's a short movie, so it just propels you through. Leto, what I kind of settled on is like because we talked about Jared Leto and comic book movies and why they're not going well together. I think in some ways he's too committed as an actor. He takes these so seriously, seriously that you yeah. feel like at every moment in time, he's not having fun. And I remember feeling that way about the Joker, too. Like the Joker, it was sadistic, but it was like it was forced. It didn't it, feel. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. He played the Joker in Suicide yes, Squad, yes. even though, you know, and it, you know, Ledger had this spontaneity and this levity in a twisted, dark way that felt so natural. Like he was like, I'm not watching a performer. I'm watching someone who transformed into this character, studied the comics, and this is what he came up with. With Leto, I had always this feeling of like, he, he is trying so hard because he is an extreme method actor. And I felt yeah. that way in this movie. Every line is delivered so seriously. Every cliche is represented as if like, this is my heat diner scene. Like everything, it felt like that. And it's just, it doesn't work. Like you need, even when he tries to deliver the occasional joke, it's so flat that like, you're so far gone. You just, you lose that energy with him, even though he clearly is like, put a lot into it. You can see the effort. 
and he has a look like he i get why the casting and the director they went for him because he he looks the part like he physically has a very distinctive face and he got in sort of very good wiry strong shape for this and yeah it's just it just doesn't grab you you just feel disconnected from him the entire time and once that happens now that good supporting cast matt smith Jared harris you just lose them because like they can't yeah. feed off of this like central energy in the movie so that was my like couldn't get past it you know that was my second sort of big failing i think the third one is the vfx they're rough man like in the trailer they don't look as bad i think because right. they you don't see as much of the venom effects in the trailer they're kind of quick cut in the movie there's a lot of them and they have yeah. this like way of him teleporting around that is like it, it's like Zack snyder with no budget it's like they're trying to put a lot of flash and a lot of like colors and a lot of movement and then quick cut slow-mo and like it's just mashed together and you're like i understand the production budget on this was lower it was like 75 million it shows yeah. like it shows wow. like, x2 so I, did it better nightcrawler did it better x2 nightcrawler cra crawler and that was okay. that was almost 20 years ago but see like yeah. nightcrawler was kind of minimalist right like when he would disappear and reappear the blue smoke was it like covering 80 percent of the screen right it uh, was like it felt fluid whereas this one it's like you're showered with purple or showered uh, with gray and it's just like it looks so cgi like you just don't ever believe that Leto or Matt Smith are in the shot that you're watching yeah. in the action pieces. So I think that was the third, like whoever, wh whoever sat around and said, this is the visual look that we're gonna go for, for the set pieces, it, it just didn't land. And like for a movie like this, if those three things are not in place, this, you got no chance. Like I can go to, I can go to all the secondary issues, but that you just have no chance. You can tell that I haven't seen the movie, and I will. I'm I'm quite certain I would say this. It looks like people that just wanted a money grab, that didn't care about the character. Let's get an Oscar winner, and let's do. They, they didn't care about this project, and that is something that we've been. We talked about it last time. And we're scared about Sony being the people to give you this spider verse. Yeah. They're in charge of this. That's a scary thought, man. I'm telling you, one or two more bad, bad ones. And it's people picketing you like, yo, we ain't watching Sony Marvel films. 100%. It's the classic we want to run before we walk, right? It's the, we want Sinister Six so bad that we want to skip the intermediary steps of really building characters that resonate. And, you know, because in a weird way, we'll talk about it later with Moon Knight, there clearly is an appetite for new characters. That's part of what regenerates the genre. So if you can land one of these, th there's room for that, right? In the same way that when, you know, Disney and Marvel and the pre Marvel studios landed Iron Man, it, it, it elevated Iron Man from where he was sort of in the, the midfield of the Marvel lineup to being like an A lister. So yeah. people want that, but you can't skip the steps. And like, you, it's sloppy. This movie is sloppy. Like, the, and the other thing is like, the, you know, the director's been out there kind of talking about the critiques and how he takes it so personally. It's like, pacing of this movie is wrong. Like, it's short that's good like yeah. kind of merciful it felt i tell you it felt longer than the batman it felt longer than the batman <laughs> even though it was almost half as long in actuality yeah, yeah, yeah. But the pacing's all wrong right that's the thing is the pacing's weird like you get this like you're two-thirds three-quarters of the way through the movie you haven't really spent any time with the true villain and all of a sudden you get the classic like villain montage where he's like discovered his powers and is out doing bad things that occurs in like the last 25 minutes of the movie and you're like yeah Okay, so this scene is going to be immediately followed by the final fight, which it was. Yeah. And then you have this love interest, which is completely wasted. Like, 
it didn't make any sense at all. The character basically is so unilaterally supportive of Jared Leto breaking every rule and code of conduct along the way, falling in love with him. And then, spoiler alert, she's magically transformed into her own sort of anti-hero, superhero vampire by his bite at the end. And you're like, that's the payoff for something that wasn't earned over the course of 90 minutes. Like, I just didn't yeah. care. And I don't understand yeah. her motivation for backing him at every turn when he doesn't really treat her all that well. So, you know, there was that. And then there's the, I mean, I mean, I guess at this point, Tyrese has so much money from Fast franchise and Transformers <laughs> franchise that it doesn't really matter. But I don't really know what he's doing in the movie. Like, he has <laughs> literally nothing to do. And, he, and like the best part of Tyrese is like his energy and like his kind of almost brash person. And they just tell him he's, he's operating at volume one. Like he's just yeah. dead panning. Like every, it's like, it makes no sense. And that's even before you get to what everyone's talking about, which to the point about forcing a universe is the spoiler alert, Michael Keaton appearance in the credits, which I mean, I'm going to say there's a 90% chance that Marvel undoes that somewhere in its upcoming films or shows and basically just reverses that scene. You know, and it's like, I mean, I'll just say it. If you don't want to hear it, just log it off. But like, you know, Keaton gets sent into Morbius's universe by Doctor Strange's spell, presumably. Purple sky. He's immediately released from prison. We don't get any context. He then, as Vulture, so continuity question. So if Toombs is how transported from one universe to the other, how's his gear all is of there. a sudden yeah, yeah. there? Sloppy. He appears as Vulture, full costume. No reason why Michael Morbius would go to meet this guy, but he does. And then he says, he literally drops Spider-Man's name He's like, I don't really know why I'm here. I think it's because of Spider-Man. <laughs> and you know what? I think guys like us should team up. And Leto's like, intriguing. And that's it. And then you're like, that is so weak. It is so sloppy. Like, what are we doing here? Other than we are rushing to Sinister Six and we take all the people like us for fools along the way, which is kind of what I felt. Yeah. Some people, some people have a way with words. They say, "Oh, this movie is not terrible, but it's not good." What the hell does that mean? They're the same thing in my book. If it's not good. If it's, especially when we're talking about a movie, why would I waste my time with a movie that's not good? And you wouldn't even recommend it to me. Why would I waste my time watching a movie like this? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a one to one and a half stars tops. Um, but I think the Sheesh. other thing, like the worst, the worst, in some ways, the worst thing about it is when we get to Sinister Six, if we get to Sinister Six, you, there's no need for you to watch this movie. Like they can put Leto's Morbius in the Sinister Six movie, and you're good to roll, like without <laughs> having seen it, which is kind of rough. Like if you think about like Avengers Endgame, it's kind of hard to watch Endgame if you haven't watched the 21 films that come before. You get away with not watching all of them, but there's a few that you need, right? So the fact that they can. I can just take the Morbius character and I can put him in an ensemble movie right now and say, I don't even need what happened in this movie for him to sort of, you can get the idea. You can yeah, flash yeah. back for 30 seconds and get the idea of how he got to be this way. Yeah. But just it, to our broader point, it is concerning that this script got past the writer's room. And into production. Was there anything that you liked about this movie? I mean, I you know, I, I said I didn't lo I didn't like Leto. I appreciated his effort. I mean, like he he, he clearly was trying. Um, 
I kind of like, I mean, I, you know, Matt Smith, I always kind of like Matt Smith. He was in the crown. He was Dr. Who he's never bad. And I feel like he's kind of wasted in this, but like he, even, he, he does have a few moments that are kind of fun. Um, but other than that, not really, man, this was, this was a rough hour 40. Like I was even projecting like, okay, when this is on TNT or TBS or whatever it's going to be <laughs> on, like, are there scenes that you want to check in on? What? I don't think there's any. Like, I really don't. Like, I don't think there's much here that you want to, like, the stuff that's supposed to be cool feels ripped off. Like, there's a scene where Morbius does the first transformation and they basically steal, you know, the classic trope of a bunch of guys in a dimly lit area with weapons and then they're, they're quickly, like, disappear, right? They're, like, mm-hmm. called off screen by a monster they can't see. And it's it's like you've seen it a hundred times you know and then the final set the final act is if you've seen all the scenes in the nolan trilogy where bruce is surrounded by the bats or use the uses the bats kind of like in remember in the batman begins where you use the bats as backup okay they ripped that off for the final scene of this movie basically he uses oh, as his like big weapon hey Oh, well, we're going to do, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm telling yeah. you. Just... It makes me sad, you know, because this, this is the kind of stuff that turns people off from the genre, you know, and the genre is still going, man. There's still a, and Marvel is this, yo, Marvel is the savior of all this, man. Marvel's the savior because they're doing dope stuff and they got, <laughs> listen, what I want to do, for Jared Leto, we gotta find a character that he would that you would want him to play in uh, in, in in MCU. What? Like he could have been Adam Warlock. As I said, he has a very distinctive look, and he is able to transform because of his method acting. So he can be, he could put on. He's like a little. He's a little like Christian Bale. Like you want him to put on hundred pounds and change his hair, and change, he'll do it. Like you want him to look emaciated and really scary and inhuman he'll do it like silver surfer interesting that's a very but so, but but i will say for him to work in the mcu he has to find the lighter side he does like he has like he is a very serious performer and so and look there are a lot of great actors who are like that there are a lot of great actors who don't want to touch comedy because it's not their bag but yeah, like yeah. if he's going to come into the mcu someone's got to write for him or like direct him in a way that like makes it seem like he's having fun because it just Got doesn't it. feel like he's en- like entertaining you. Yeah, it's a rough, it's, that's a rough goal, man. Let us know in the comments below if you saw Morbius um, and what character would you cast uh, Jared Leto as in, in, in the MCU? That, that's an interesting one because so far he's over for 2. Yeah. And by the way, I know there's been some like, there's there's a corner of the internet that's saying this is better than the Batman, and like, my, I mean, that's that's just clickbait. That has yeah. to be clickbait. No, that has to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just people wanting attention. That's all. Yeah. Um. Next up, Brian. Two weeks. You've been like, yo, we gotta talk about this. We gotta talk about it. I'm not a Star Trek dude. You know, I appreciate. I did li- like the 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 first J.J. Uh, Abrams Star Trek. The second one was was not that great for me. Um, felt like they cheated in that second one. But um, you do watch the shows. You are a fan of the shows. Yep. Talk to me a little bit about Picard and what Paramount Plus is doing over uh, over at that streaming service. Yeah, I you know I I, I mentioned this before. I was just a, there's there, there were these kind of there were these green shoots of like Paramount really let like laying into a Star Trek universe that made a lot of sense to me. And I think I mentioned this in one of our previous shows, which is they had started to they were using animated, they were using kind of um, things that were set in a timeline close to the original series, the Shatner Nimoy timeline. Yeah. And they were kind of 
you know, with Picard, they were kind of playing the hits of sort of the next generation DS9, DS9 era. And I feel like this week, things have leveled up in a way that I have to give them credit. I think we talked a lot about what the MCU is doing and how they connect things together. And I think Paramount, when it comes to Star Trek, has kind of righted the ship here. Like, they, they, you know, you mentioned the Abrams, the Abrams, I guess, two movies, and then Justin Lin did Star Trek Beyond. Star Trek continues to kind of be hit or miss as a big screen proposition. But in TV land, there's some exciting stuff happening. Like, Discovery was a decent show. They just released a trailer this week for Strange New Worlds, which is basically the Enterprise under Captain Pike before Captain Kirk takes over. Played oh, by uh, Anson Mount um, as Captain Pike, and they've got young Spock and like young Uhura, and it looks really good. Like the the old Enterprise is in there, but like with modern effects, and like it looks very classic Trekkie, except like updated, you know, for for the twenty twenty first century. So that was cool. And then on the back of that, we got a casting announcement that Picard season three would be the final season of that show, but it was not going to be a Picard season. It was going to be a full-on Star Trek Next Generation reunion season with the entire cast coming wow. back to star in the season. Like, actually star, start to finish. Which wow. I think is just super cool because I mean, those people actually legit, unlike the original cast, this cast legitimately remained really good friends. Like, after the show was over, they do conventions together all the time. So there's an attachment not just the people from the 80s and 90s, but even current people are aware of who they are. So yeah. I actually love that Paramount is bookending that show with a real callback and kind of a must, what I think is going to be a must-see event for probably 2023, 2024, by having all these people come back. And so I just want to highlight it because it, I feel like in the world of streaming, when you have IP, you got to be smart about it. And I actually feel like Paramount's being really smart about how they're doling out star trek tv ip right now and it's like yeah. they are gonna get subscribers because of what went out this week no question in my mind so i'm excited like you know i think when you combine it with like whatever we think of halo halo has been pretty popular for them it's definitely added a lot of subs um did you see the first episode i did <laughs> you know it's not my favorite yeah um but I think like it just speaks to like I think Paramount on the whole is getting a little traction here. Like they're kind of making some noise as, as something that you might want to consider for your streaming menu. And I think, you know, Star Trek still resonates with so many people that if you get that right, I mean, that's that's huge. So, yeah, I just wanted to highlight it because I think it is a big deal. And I think you're going to see, you know, kind of Paramount when you add in, by the way, we didn't talk about Yellowstone because it's not a our genre but like they've got i think five yellowstone shows in production right now so they've got that universe they got star trek universe and they're trying to build halo and trying to go in other directions like it doesn't take much if you got three to four things that people have to have to, have to watch people are going to pay some money to do that so i don't think halo lasts you know probably not but if, as I said, if it gets acquired, the fact that the show exists is going to be an asset. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, man. The streaming wars are, you know, they're in effect, boy. And by the way, so there's already, because um, we know Tom Cruise is supposedly wrapping up his run on Mission Impossible with Mission Impossible 8, right? There is, or I know there's a rumor that he's been basically fending off Paramount from, from restarting Mission Impossible, the TV series, as long as he's starring in the films. So that means 1,000% after MI8 is out and its run is done, there's a Mission Impossible universe coming. And duh, why not? not now I'm going to sign up. Now I'm going to sign up. If that, when that happens, when that gets announced, and when, does that sit, when that series begins, I'm signing up for that because I want to see that. I do want to see the offer. Yeah, that was so that's too. so that's a wait and see. But um, yeah, Paramount man, there's good content, man. There's good content, and and, and people are going to compete because there's money to be made, you know. So uh, that's it's, it's very interesting times, man. And we said last year, yo, the content that's going to be coming out is going to be 
great. It's gonna be so much content. And look at look at there's so much content happening right now. I gotta say, like since we're talking about this, I'm sure Amazon's gonna do some great stuff with uh, MGM, but like the James Bond reality greatest race reality show, not a good lead off. That's was the what is this? So you know that that reality show that was the greatest race that's been around for like 20, 25 years where they go the, around the world. From place oh, to place uh, the amazing race. race. Amazing race. Sorry, not great. Yes, yeah. Amazing race. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Amazon basically closed on the MGM deal the other day. And the first thing they announced was they're going to basically copycat the amazing race, but it's, but it's going to be all James Bond locales. And you're going to have to like do James Bond-esque missions in these places. And I'm like, really? We're pl playing the reality card with the Bond franchise out of the gate? That's a minus one for me compared to what Paramount's doing. That's a minus one. <laughs> <laughs> we can do better oh, than that. I'm sure, man. It's like, you got to slap Dave's Bond stuff onto that. You can't do nothing else. You can't be original. You got to keep doing that James Bond stuff. Go. Where's my Bond TV show though? Like, where, where's an actual like double O show? I thought wasn't that the point of some of the characters that you put in the last movie? Like, yeah, I don't know, just felt like yeah. a felt like a real cheap uh, cheap way out to kind of get some. Yeah. Anyway, oh, uh, let us know in the comment section what you guys think of uh, Picard and Paramount. Uh, are you subscribers? Are you going to subscribe? What would you subscribe for? Have you seen Halo? Are you going to continue watching Halo? Do you think it's going to last? Let us know in the comment section below. Uh, next up. So this, there seems to be uh, not quite a 100% a, a confirmation, but Marvel seemingly confirms uh, that the Netflix Marvel shows are canon. Um, Brian. What does this mean for these characters going forward um, in the MCU? So the specifics that I saw were effectively what amounted to a biography of Matt Murdock in the MCU. And that biography alluded to the events of seasons one, two, and three of the Netflix Daredevil show and the Defender show and seem to acknowledge that where we're seeing Matt Murdock in No Way Home and where we're gonna see him from here follows those events, which would imply that they actually happened in Earth 616 while everything else we were seeing with the non-Netflix non and of course, traditional Disney MCU what was happening. I mean, I think at least in the case of Daredevil, it's an acknowledgement that the show was good, which we know. Of course. Of course. So they were like, we don't we don't really wanna we don't want to erase the memory of something that people really responded really to. really that enjoyed yeah, number yeah. one you know as to why they did that versus like star wars obviously retconned a lot of stuff out of canon you know they they obviously went a different route for a different reason and wanted to kind of clean up the storyline but in this case like i think people generally would want that now my question throwing it back to you is if you do that for one, you kind of got to do that for all. Are we okay with all of the Netflix characters and their shows becoming canon, if that's the case? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, you, we already know Finn Jones is out. It's like, you just, you just can't do it. I just can't do it. Luke Cage, I think we might get a replacement. I don't know. We might, he might come back because there's A, there's money to be made, and I don't know what you've been do, up to lately. I know you watched some show called Evil. I don't, I don't, I don't hear anything about that, right? So he may want the spotlight again because when he when he was Luke Cage, the spotlight was on him. Why? Because he was sort of like in the MCU. That was never quite clear, really, um, because of all some of the stuff said in the show. Um, but yeah, I think those two are, uh, are probably going to be replaced. But I'm not sure about um, 
Lucas, uh, Christian Witter. Christian Witter. Christian yeah, Witter, yeah. yeah she, I think she'll come back because I, I think agree. she did a hell of a job. Yeah, and obviously, you know, Charlie Cox is back. So, but let's see. And Bernthal wants you... back. So we'll see if, yeah. He's busy though. That's the only one. I almost wonder yeah. if he's he... Has he gotten to a place where he, he said he would do it, but like he's in a lot of stuff these days. So yeah, yeah, he's a he's fantastic, the guy. Yeah, it's like you want him in your movie because he can bring the goods. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens uh, with some of these characters and how they introduce him, and it's going to be very interesting. I don't think a that- recast is an issue, though. I think you can you can acknowledge the events of the defenders and and have have a new. A new iron yeah, fist. Yeah, yeah, like, true, true, true. Maybe true. maybe like an iron fist who actually knows martial arts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would be interesting who they get for that. I want to see that. That's that's what I would want to see because I know I'm gonna get a better showing, in my opinion, than Mr. Shang Chi in terms of the martial arts aspect. <laughs> I wasn't too impressed. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not impressed. I, I wasn't impressed with Shang Chi stuff. To me, it's like more like Jackie Chan. That's what it looked like to me. Anyway, um, next up, Sam Raimi is considering or would consider doing another Spider-Man film with Tony McGuire. Brian, I don't think that happens. I don't think it needs to happen. Unless you have a compelling story. Let's see what happens with Doctor Strange 2 is what I'd say. Your thoughts? Um, his comments suggest... So I'm, I actually did I would love to... I actually wanted to see a tape of this because I read his comments and I was like, I want to see him actually answering this question because he kind of answers the question in a way that almost suggests he either forgot the rights situation around this for a second. Um, so obviously he was basically saying, had a great time with Doc Strange 2, love what the MCU and the Disney machine does, would love to continue to be a part of that. And then of course I'd be open and interested and, and, and he said, doing this project has made me think that all things are possible and I could come, you know, and I could come back and I would be interested to do something with Tobey Maguire, including another Spider-Man. So, I need the I need the breaks sound effect. So Sam, my man, if you're doing that, it's not going to be with Disney because yeah, yeah, that yeah. project belongs to Sony. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he's kind of equating the experience within the Disney side and saying I want to apply that to Spider-Man Four, and I'm like, well, that's not how it would work. So yeah, let's, yeah. let's stop right there. Second thing is, I mean, this is the thing that happens, right? Like. When you when you hit a home run the way that No Way Home did, yeah, you get the law of diminishing returns, right? So people are excited and like they want the Andrew Garfield Spider Man. So then, you know, I mean Kirsten Dunst, I feel like is putting out a quote every week saying she wants to be MJ again. And now you know, now you get Sam Raimi saying, I right, sure I'd love to do a four Spider Man again. And and I think from his perspective, given how Spider Man three went and his own acknowledgement of how it failed. Uh-huh. In his eyes, I understand why he would be personally motivated to come back and maybe try to bookend his Spider-Man run in a better way. Yeah, I'm not convinced Tobey Maguire feels that way. Yeah, um... you know, I, think, I think I think it took a lot pro- of the of the three guys. He was the one who probably took the most convincing to come back to do No Way Home, and uh-huh. for him to sign up to do a multi-month shoot. And be like, hey, we want you to sign a three-picture deal. Like, man, he's like, I want to play cards. Like, I just don't <laughs> know that he wants to do that again. He, I mean, depending how poker goes, he might need that re-up money. <laughs> so but I think he strikes me as a guy that would like the. I'll show up for a day or two. I'll get my bag. People remember that I was fun as Spider-Man, and I'm good. I just don't know that he wants to headline. A movie again so whereas we feel like the garfield one has some momentum and andrew garfield is up for it i think less than 50 percent chance that a toby mcguire spider-man 4 happens um and if it does i think we got to acknowledge if it does 
it would be somewhat of a weird validation of Warner Brothers and DC's approach to Superman, which is basically, and Batman, which is like, you can throw as many of these up on screen together. And as long as there's an audience, it's not going to matter. Like if we wind up with three Spider-Man plus Miles Morales in live action, like, you know, it's four versions of the same character. Like, so a lot. <laughs> yeah. I see myself getting more Spider-Man out or Spider-Man fatigue than me being fatigued of the whole genre. So I hope this is just, you know, No Way Homes, I'm pretty sure brought back a lot of memories for those people who were involved in the Spider-Man stuff, right? And the possibility and the reaction that people got um, to those characters, I'm pretty sure th those people who were involved, Sam Raimi and whoever else, uh, Andrew Garfield, we can do something dope, you know, but whether it's going to happen, uh, you know, that is a tough call, man. It's a tough call. And it right does, now. you know, it goes in different ways. It goes in different ways. So, like, if I, if I was thinking about other comparisons to this, so when they brought Boba Fett and Tamir Morrison into the Mandalorian as sort of a cameo one episode, one or two. It was super cool. Right? Everyone's like, whoa, Boba Fett back on screen. And then they launched his own show. And that wound up being a pretty uneven experience once they tried to have him headline his own thing. You know, flip side, obviously, maybe one of the more successful ones is, you know, Fast and Furious franchise, Vin Diesel left right after the first film. They got him to cameo at the end of Tokyo Drift. And, you know, the rest is history, right? Like that, that relaunch went phenomenal. Like they repurposed the show, repurposed the character, and, and off we went into one of the most successful franchises of, of all time. So it can work. But as I said, the law of diminishing marginal returns, you need to be careful about people even like with the Andrew Garfield situation, we are hot on that. We're responding to it. Like, but you got to play your cards the right way. Just slapping up in a, you know, if they put up an equivalent to Morbius starring Andrew Garfield, all that goodwill is going to be out the window in two seconds. All we're going to remember is, oh, right. That's why this thing didn't make it to Amazing Spider-Man 3 in the first place. So you have to be careful with this. Everyone's career outside of Andrew Garfield's will be destroyed. If they made a movie like Morbius, because Andrew Garfield is a fantastic actor. Let's 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 not yeah, get it twisted. No, it's... The, the, the guy can do anything. It might and the guy can do anything. Everybody else, if you were a part of this, not so much. Yeah, that you let this happen. Um, the only way we see a bad Andrew Garfield movie in a uh, bad Spider-Man movie with Andrew Garfield is that they paid. If we see that he's getting paid a hundred million dollars. This movie's gonna be terrible. Also, let's let's also make sure that Doc Strange Two is what we hope it is before we start giving Sam Raimi. But yeah, that's why I said earlier. We, we gotta see. We gotta see. I mean, I would I would think Brian, if Sam Raimi, Sam Raimi got the opportunity to do a Toby, it's like Sam Raimi here, do whatever the hell you want, do whatever you want. And Sam Raimi's calling up for Kevin, yo, how, you know, how do you think I should do? You know what I'm saying? Sam Raimi, Sam Raimi's gonna do it the right way. He's not gonna be forced to do anything that he doesn't want to do. And Spider Man Three is 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 a, a, a fantastic example of how he lost control. You know. Um, so let's see what Doctor Strange 2 brings us. And, and if we're singing the praises of Sam Raimi and him, you know, fans, if people love this movie, man, if people love Doctor Strange 2, man, Sam Raimi can do no wrong. Let's see. Speaking of. Yeah. Doctor Strange 2. The runtime has been revealed to be two hours and six minutes. Some people are saying that's right on. Some people are saying that's too short. Why? Because of all the cameos in this film. How are you going to explain how much time you have in this movie to explain the purpose of these cameos? If these cameos is like freaking Wolverine walking across the street, 
you know what I'm saying? Then we have a problem. If these cameos don't have a reason to be there, we have a problem. It did a hell of a job with No Way Home because it made sense. This, obviously, anything goes. Brian, anything goes in this movie. It's, 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 a, it's a tough call. If they at least do it somewhat okay, if they do it just for like, oh, snap, Wolverine is sitting... I don't know. I don't know what it is going to be, but if, if these things look cringy, it's a problem. Your thoughts on the runtime, and do you have the same concerns? A couple angles for me here. So first is, it's it's kind of refreshing that you can actually still make a superhero movie with this kind of budget in two hours. Yeah, I feel like two and a half has now become the norm. And now we're obviously with the Batman, we're seeing you can push three out of the gate and yeah. it'd be just fine. So that's efficient. Um, as it pertains to the cameos, kind of, it feels kind of binary to me. Like, you know, I don't call what we got in No Way Home cameo because those characters were central to the storyline of that movie for the most yeah. part. Um, so that's part of why I think it worked, right? Those, every every character in the scene and, and, and had a purpose to yeah. further that movie along. So one theory is if it's two hours, six minutes and it's bogged down by cameos, I have a tough time seeing how this is gonna be received well. It's just, the math doesn't work, right? If you if you say, all right, I got two hours and six minutes, so figure X credits, the actual movie is one hour, 55 minutes. And then let's say cameos are, let's say it's a cameo mania. Cameos, 15 to 20 minutes. It's a 90 minute move. How is this a 90 minute move? This is the first multi-verse movie. 90 minutes? I don't get it. So that's one angle. Yeah. Here is my conspiracy theory angle. Let me throw this out at you, see what you think. <laughs> so we know that this movie was reshot and reshot and reshot. Yeah. So when I see two hours and six minutes, I'm also like, you guys have to have like six hours of footage by now. And you're, you're cutting this down to two. Mm -hmm. We also heard a rumor that I kind of laughed at initially that in, in, in the most recent cut, a lot of the cameos were dumped. So, what if, <laughs> shouts to what if, what if the theatrical version is very cameo light, but there's a deluxe version coming to Disney Plus that's like three hours and has them all in. as a test drive of whether something you and I have talked about, which is these alternate versions that could and should exist belong on these streaming platforms. What if there will be a second extended version of Doctor Strange 2 that has more of the cameos and things they shot and the only place you get to see it is on Disney Plus after this movie leaves the theater? The only way that works is this is a movie for me anyway or that I'm interested in this is if this movie is dope. If it's but whack. If it's, yeah, but if it's two hours, six minutes with minimal cameos, don't you think the odds that it's a better movie is yeah, 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 higher? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But then if they're trying to, you know, we know Disney's trying to re, you know, re-accelerate subscriber growth. Yeah. What if there is going to be a three hour Doctor Strange 2 that goes to Disney Plus. I mean, that's the only way you can see it. I'm just. That's it. That's, 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 I mean, that's an interesting thought. That is a, and a very interesting selling point. I mean, this is, this is my thought process. If you're seeing Doctor Strange 2, 
I don't know how much more subscribers can you get. I mean, because I think pretty much a lot of the subscribers of Disney Plus are, are fans of obvious of Marvel and Star Trek. I mean, not Star Trek or Star Wars and all that other stuff. But I would assume that most of them are, are subscribers already if they're going to see this movie. Not, I don't think of a, a regular person that hasn't seen anything. I mean, you could get a few here and there that, you know, because it's crazy and all this stuff, they'll go, they'll go see it. Who knows? Who knows? What if they, what if they charged you for it? What, what if, if they, they put, put the theatrical cut is on Disney Plus after 45 days for free, but for five bucks, you can watch a three hour expanded version of that. Would you pay it? Oh yeah, I would. Okay. Oh, yeah. Of course. I'm just saying, like, let's I think, let's I think see, people, let's see. People got to think, create. I, I'm just throwing it out there because this thing has that potential in a way that some of their other films don't. And I'm yeah. curious to see if Disney continues to experiment. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's that's a very interesting experiment. That's a and, and and the movie to do it with is this one. Yeah, it's a long shot, but I was just trying to reconcile conspiracy theory runtime with like what we know about how much and how much how much time has gone into making this film yeah they can pretty much put out anything regarding dr strange those those other cameos and put him in the movie it, it'll be interesting man i would if, the, if I, i'm pretty sure they're really con thinking about it that that's because that's a huge possibility with all the reshoots they've done it'll be interesting especially after scrapping so many cameos if they did yeah, if, if they yeah. did, that assumes, okay. yeah. Let's see, let, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think. Are you guys concerned about Doctor Strange 2 and its runtime? Are you concerned about all the cameos? Let us know in the comment section below. Yeah, tickets now, went on sale, so we'll see how they track. Yeah, yeah. You already got yours. I didn't get mine yet. But. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of seats available. A lot of seats available. I got the same seats that I usually get. <laughs> um, Thor Love and Thunder Chris Hemsworth is out there you know starring the press tour uh, everybody's waiting everybody's asking the question about when is this trailer coming out um, we should be getting it soon probably with, how long do you think Ryan I'm a little surprised it's not attached to Doc Strange 2. Like I know we heard Avatar 2 is. I'm surprised this one is not. So I'm, a, I mean, it has to be soon. I, mean, I know there's a lot of goodwill built up with Thor as a character off of Ragnarok, but I mean, I don't think you want to be inside 60 days when you put out your first trailer. So I would think within, within the next month, I think it probably actually, I think it will drop before Doc Strange 2 comes out, even if it's not attached to Doc Strange 2 specifically. Yeah. Um, what is that Thor Love and Thunder supposed to come out? It's uh in July, it's like yeah, late July, I think. And Doctor Strange is first week of May, okay. So that's coming up. I recently, now, as you all know, I had called the Charlie Cox and the Tobey Maguire. And when there was no confirmation, or only the rumor, but most people knew that these guys were gonna be there, but there was no confirmation. I confirmed with my insider and we we said, we said it on the show. I told Brian about it, Brian about it. And he said, yo, let's talk about it. Let's say it. So this one, I got some more information. And this is concerning a particular character in uh, Marvel, um, one that we've talked about in the past. And we did a, I did a show with uh, uh, Tracy a long time ago regarding the possibilities of this character. And for Thor Love and Thunder, we all know the, the villain there is, Thor, is Gore the God Butcher. And we've also heard rumor that Russell Crowe is going to be in this movie as Zeus, right? We can assume that 
Gore the God Butcher is going to come after Zeus. Right? It's a big possibility. Well, what I heard, and you can take this with a grain of salt, but my insider hasn't failed me. He said that Hercules will be in this film. He is in this film. Um, so you heard it here first. You can make the assumption that this, uh, why, yeah, why, why not? It makes sense for Hercules to be, but there's been no confirmation. Nobody's talking about this. I'm here to tell you now that Hercules, is, is, I, I haven't confirmed it, but I have strong indication that Hercules is going to be in Thor, Love and Thunder. Brian, what are your reactions to this possibility happening uh, in this movie? I love it. I, lo I mean, Marvel, Marvel has sort of the, you know, and we, you know, in, a, in some ways we started to touch on it with Eternals. Marvel has the mythological wing kind of of their of their library, and yeah. we kind of stayed away from it, you know, up through these phases. But you're right, the God Mutcher is the logical place. And if we heard that Zeus is being put in this movie in a small way, that's the logical segue. And if you're gonna go that route, the obvious sort of big name hero that everyone knows and would sell and get a lot of attention would be Hercules. Yeah, and Hercules is boy, I tell you what, there's been no inkling of like, who's getting cast or like, they've kept that really well under wraps. So if that's a cameo that's been shot, and we're going to be introduced to that character in the movie. It's a big moment. It's a big yes. moment. Yes, it is. And we have no idea who will play the character. But I've always said uh, the dude from this movie called Bigger. He played Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie called Bigger. And his name is Kalen Von Moger. He's a bodybuilder. Um, I think he did a, they did like a Netflix documentary show. Uh, reality show on, uh, on the platform and it's very interesting um i haven't seen bigger obviously we didn't hear much about the movie i don't know if he can he because he wants to be an actor he wants to be like on a solution again he idolizes that dude can he act we'll have to see but hercules to me as i remember as a kid and it's not necessarily just the Lou Ferrigno movies. They had that playing on the other, like a week ago. That, yo, that is it's a rough horrible. Watch. What? You want to see Are some you... tough effects? Go, go check those out. It's not even tough. <laughs> those effects were horrendous. But, you know, Lou Ferrigno looked great, man. He's a believable Hercules. Because of Although his they dubbed physique. his voice. Yeah, they dubbed, they dubbed his, his voice, voice. exactly. Yeah, it's, it's not him talking. They did a good job of dubbing, too. But um, he's a big guy. So I, I, I'm sorry, but I, don't, I, I, wasn't, I was never interested in the Kevin Sorbo Hercules, even though it was very popular. Um, there's been uh, several iter iterations of Hercules with The Rock playing him. To me, The Rock is The Rock. So I, I didn't love that. Going. I didn't love yeah. that take. That, that picked yeah. a specific part. That that changed the DNA of Hercules to make him kind of more this like down on his down on life, you know, later on post labors mercenary guy who kind of lost yeah. his way and like it's not Hercules to me to be honest. Yeah, like Hercules yeah, yeah. is always like he's the consummate Greek hero, right? Yeah. He, you know. Um who, who kind of can never catch a break, really. That's sort of the, yeah. the, the, the in the mythology, right? But so I think you're looking for someone heroic, but I don't know. In terms of the look, it's interesting. Like, I don't know. I mean, does her I mean, does Hercules have to be any more built than like Chris Hemsworth has become for Thor? I don't think so. Like, just in terms of like physique. I mean, the the Rock obviously has a physique that no other actor is really going to be able to realistically match these days. Like, but I don't know that Hercules has to be that gigantic to be. He does. He doesn't have to be gigantic. Because I, I, I'll tell you what, I was, um, when I was in high school, I used to take Latin. 
and we were and we, and, and, yeah and we were and we did a, we were reading a story in latin about hercules and we were translating and stuff like that and one of the passages was like this dude was huge you know what i'm saying and so i sort of want to sort of want to see that on screen if that's what he was and that's what people describe him if you read um about hercules he was a big dude so yeah I, i'd like to, I, I think if they do get that guy, he would be the perfect guy. I just don't see anybody else playing. So I, I'm trying. We keep trying to re, we keep trying to cast this guy in different comic roles. I will float one other name because I do think, to your point, I think height is very important. Hercules cannot be short. Yes, that's that's why I threw the Hemsworth physique out because Hemsworth, I think, is six four. Like he's okay. six three. He's pretty tall, and so. He's he's pretty lean. Now he's bulked up a lot because of the Hulk Hogan biopic, but like you can see, he's probably carrying about as much muscle right now as that frame is gonna hold. Yeah. And so I was trying, like, all right, you know, if you and even like Schwarzenegger in his heyday was pretty tall for a bodybuilder. He was six two, six three as well. Yeah. Um, like when he played Conan, like to, to you know, that it's gonna be tough to get someone to that level. Yeah. How big do you think Pablo Schreiber could get? Because we know he can act, and he's got a little bit of the Mediterranean. Look. He has that like ethno look where he can kind of be any ethnicity. He's six foot five. I've never seen him play a role where he was huge. Now he was pretty big in um, oh, what's the movie with Gerard Butler, the the heist movie? Yeah, with Fifty you know Cent and uh, Thieves, something about Thieves. Then a thief. Then a Thieves. Yeah. He's kind of bigger in that, but like not sculpted. I keep trying to bring him into the universe. I know you you have him as as one of your one of your one of your potential X Men, um, but I there just aren't a lot. I mean, Hollywood's not a place where you find really tall guys. I mean, Affleck was six four. He obviously is not going to do it. He doesn't look the part. Yeah, no, he's done. But I don't know. I was that's that's the one guy. I was like, he's tanned. He's kind of dark. That's kind of what I imagine Hercules to look like. Could he put on 30, 40 pounds? That's and, a tough ask. That's a tough ask. Maybe. I also, I also the other guy who I don't think quite has the the presence. But if you've seen have, the guy who played Hawk in Titans, who who bulked up to be Reacher, he's six four and two forty, and he carries it really well. I, have I just don't him, think he could be Hercules. I don't know. If I, he ha, be I have I, I have him as Hyperion. Okay, you have him as a you have him as a mythological character then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's tall enough and seemingly can carry enough muscle. That was the other guy I could think of who maybe, maybe might he, get a look. He's hot. He's also hot right now. He's getting a lot of offers. Yeah, off the and, and for and for those of you who don't know, Hyperion is sort of like the Marvels. I mean, he's one of a few Superman like characters, right? The yeah. Sentry, Hyperion, and he's sort of like a bad guy, Hyperion, right? Yep. If that, if that's I'm not sure if that is the correct name, but I am familiar with the characters. I've seen him before in Avengers animated shows and stuff like that. Um, he's a pre pretty formidable guy, and that guy, um, I forget his name, but he was in he was in uh, uh, Reacher and what's the other one yeah. on the Titans? Well, he was he was Hawk and Titans. He was he was actually Aquaman in Smallville a long time ago. And Alan and Richen, was, uh, that's Richen, that's his name. Yeah, and he was in some comedy, Blue State Mountain uh, College, some college. Uh, he, also, he, also mo he also motion captured Raphael in the Michael Bay, Jonathan Hensley, TMNT. Oh. Actually, it's a random story. I met him, actually, because he I was uh, one of the summers I was living in New York. He was shooting that movie, and he was doing a, he was renting in the building that I was living in. So, like, okay. we worked out in the same gym. That guy is insane in the gym. Yeah. I'm just telling you, he was insane, yeah. like, 10 years ago. <laughs> and now he's like 30, 40 pounds big. Like his workout, I, I could, like I work out a decent amount. Like I would queue over like one workout that I was doing. It was insane. Yeah, I mean, that guy's on his way. That guy's on his way. He, he played a hell of a Reacher. Um, and a lot of people appreciate it because in, in the books, Reacher's a big guy. A lot of people- The big guy, the big blonde had, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, didn't, they had a problem with Tom Cruise being Reacher. But that's neither here nor there. Let's move on. Anyway, Hercules MCU. That would be huge. That would be yes. Uh, literally. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. Let's let's see what happens there. Let's see what happens there. So you hear, you heard it here first. 
Hercules. Big chance that he's going to be in this movie um, based on what my sources are telling me. Um, let us know in the comments what you guys think of that possibility. Uh, next up, WB reevaluating Ezra Miller and his situation here with the Flash. Brian, we talked about this last week. We called this, yeah. It's like, what do you do? Now they're talking about it. Let's get I don't know if we sort of gave our opinion as to what must be done. Brian, what do you think must be done? What do you think what what do you think they're doing? So let's talk about what we know and then what's being reported. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say they're doing more than reevaluating. So the story that's being portrayed is that to keep in mind, all, all of this is occurring, what we're going to talk about here, the, the AT&T, the, the Discovery kind of Warner merger is about to close. So we know that, you know, David Zaslav and company have kind of been behind the scenes at the controls, but they will legally be at the controls very, very shortly. And the report is that they had a, quote, crisis meeting on March 30th to discuss Ooh. the status of Ezra Miller and his relationship to the studio, to the studio. So that this is important because ah. he is in Fantastic Beasts and he's the Flash. So he's on two sides. He's in the Harry Potter franchise and the, the DC, DC universe. The report that's coming out is that all Ezra, all Ezra Miller related projects have been placed on hold indefinitely. Now, whether now what's not confirmed is does that so it obviously that does not include Fantastic Beasts 3, which is going to release in a week. It has not been confirmed. Now we know the flash was delayed. It has not been confirmed what that means for the final outcome of the Flash. Now, the story indicated that any sequel to the Flash is on ice, but the Flash itself sounds like it's in limbo and the studio is not sure what exactly they're gonna do with this big budget movie that they are now stuck with. I mean, oh, this, this is, I mean, David Zaslav's walking into a hornet's nest day one. This is like a, this was the movie to rechart the DC universe and they can't release it because the star might get dumped. That's a problem. What do you think they're going to do? So this ties to a second piece of news and I'll give you my thought on that. So Jason Kalar, who's the head of Warner Media, and I kind of called this a long time ago. Long, I long said, time don't, yeah, yeah. don't pay any attention to I'm staying, we're going to run, we're going to work together. Don't listen to any of that. David Zasloff is a longtime media mogul and media moguls want their people. Not we talked other about people. this last year. Last year, last we summer, called this last a year summer. ago. So Kalar was running Warner Media and it was like, oh, it's like a one big happy family. He's out. And supposedly up to nine senior executives are going out with him as the deal is closing. And most importantly, Jason Kalar's role is not being replaced. David Zasloff is taking the position himself. Wow. So the CEO of the company is also going to be the CEO of Warren. Like he basically is holding two roles at once, which should tell you a little bit about how this guy intends to run things out of the gate. It's my show. It reminds me of Kevin Spacey taking over the role with horrible bosses. <laughs> he, promoted... <laughs> he hired himself to take over the job, my friends. This is crazy. So that, We're going to have to keep that up leads with this me story. To... That leads me to David Zaslav has no allegiance to anything that came before. And if he's going to be putting his stamp on the future, I would not rule out that they recast and write off this movie. 
they just take a hundred fifty million dollar loss L. and start over. That's what now I was they, saying. They could rehire Muschietti. They could say, "Look, we like Muschietti. We like the work you did, Christina Hodson. We like your script, Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck. Please, can we get a few more days of your time?" All that stuff might still be something you could salvage and pay out enough money to do. But to me, I wouldn't rule out that they dump Ezra Miller, take a charge as a public company, and they say that was the prior regime's fault. And we're going to get this right, and we're going to start it over. And until we do. We're not releasing this. Yeah. It's either take an L or we do the joint. The, is it too much trouble to recast and reshoot? Is it is it is it is, it, is that a possibility? So, you know, nothing's impossible. The movie's done. So that one of the um One of the issues is usually when you get a situation like this, you're just much earlier in production. Uh, like, so one of the most highest profile examples of this was way back when Eric Stoltz was Marty McFly and he was Marty McFly for, I think it was three or four weeks. And then they fired him. Michael J. Fox came available and the rest is history. But like at the time, just to give you perspective, that added like 30% to the film's budget. To just, for, just for a couple of weeks of the lead shooting scenes and being replaced. So you can do the math. I mean, this is a movie that probably was budgeted at 150 or higher. To take out and totally redo all of the scenes involving the lead character, I mean, it's probably going to make it a $300 million budget movie, which probably means you're losing money on this almost any way you cut it. So I think for Zasloff, the question's going to be, is the movie I have in hand, if I, my options are, I can release The Flash as is with Ezra Miller. And I know I'm going to lose money on that because of he's, because his, he's toxic, can't promote it, and he's fired. Yeah. Do I double the budget, keep the structure of the movie the same, bring in a new star. Can I, can I, can this movie achieve what it was originally supposed to for the universe? Or do I just blame it on the outgoing management, write it down entirely to zero and start over with a new cast and a new director that I have? Or maybe I rehire Muschietti after that process. I don't know that there's like a right answer to that. I mean, do you have a strong yeah. opinion on what you would want to see? What I would want to see is take the L and if you're going to do it right, do it right. You get Jeffrey Dean Morgan to play Batman's father. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you want Michael Keaton, you set him up for Batman Beyond. If we're going to do these things, let's do it right. Let's not Whatever they were attempting to do there, you know, would it have been possible for Ben Affleck scene to, no, because what I was hoping, if you ever saw that animated film, what transpires with Bruce Wayne's father in that changed reality that Flash created, and what happens when Flash goes back, there's an exchange there that's very impactful to Batman fans and obviously to Bruce Wayne Batman himself. That was special to see, in my opinion. I would have loved to have seen that, what that experience would have would be. I w if it was me, Brian, I'd take the L. I'd be like, yo, give me 150 mil and let's do this the right way. I am also going to guess that Zasloff is smart enough that to realize that if, if you release the movie as is and it's not well received and the press around it is bad because of Miller's conduct, you have set back 
it, it, you've set back the character in the universe beyond just the one movie. So if you want the movie to go to posterity, you could always put it on HBO Max, right? And kind of say like, hey, this is a piece of art that was done, but yeah. it wasn't really the official thing that we intended to do. And then you could kind of start over yeah, yeah. and disown it as like, it's not canonical, but like <laughs> we made it. If you want to watch it, here it is. It's fully yeah. edited, it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'd be surprised if we saw in June 2023, if we get a Flash movie, I kind of will be surprised if it's the one they're holding right now. And the other thing is, they supposedly were going to do extensive reshoots already, and Ezra Miller didn't want to do those. That's one of the things that came up in the story, is that ah. he was very flaky on the set of this movie, that he would not in a... like So he's had problems with like violence and alcohol outside the set. Supposedly that wasn't an issue on the set, but it almost read like the pressure got to him on the set. Like he would not be able to execute a scene because he would kind of get, I think the article described, like he would have a, a view as to how it would be done and then be like, he would just be like, what am I doing? What am I doing? He would just completely implode and they wouldn't be able to shoot. And so he apparently was vehemently opposed to doing any reshoots. And the studio was saying, we need to do at least standard reshoots, if not more extensive ones. So all of that to me is pointing toward he's going to be let go. It's just a question of how they do this. I mean, he's definitely going to be recast and written out of Fantastic Beasts. He's like the third or fourth supporting character in that, which yeah. I mean, that series now they've gotten rid of Johnny Depp. They've got, they're going to get rid of Ezra Miller. I mean, <laughs> that cast is dropping like flies, but um, yeah, I just can't see any way. Like, why does Zaslav want to deal with this? I mean, he's just not, he doesn't have any allegiance to Ezra Miller and he, I don't know why he's going to be in the Ezra Miller business going forward. Yeah. We are going to continue to keep you updated on this because this is very interesting. Yep. Well, to, we quote, uh, to quote Charlie Cox to Ezra Miller, you need a really good lawyer. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> Oh, snap. Yep. Anyway, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of all of this. Are you, do you want to see what they've done? Uh, do you want Ezra Miller replaced? Do you think they should reshoot or, or they should start from scratch? He'll take that L. If you want to put it on HBO Max, go ahead. But if you're going to do it, do it the way the fans wanted it to be done in the first place. Let us know in the comment section below. Plus one for the Batgirl movie, by the way, if the Flash gets shelved and Michael Keaton's return as Batman actually debuts in the Batgirl movie, plus one for that film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be interesting. You think... Uh, we'll talk about it some other time. Yeah. I was gonna, I was going to ask you if you think that's going to be HBO... Stay on HBO Max. Let's see. Let's see. Um, Star Wars. Um, got some interesting things happening very soon. Um, right before the Kenobi uh, series debuts, there, what was the article, uh, Brian? They're going to make some uh, future project announcement at some event. Yeah, I think they're basically, it seems like they're kind of splitting the old D23 into the various IPs. So Star Wars is basically going to get its own D23 on May 26th. And you're going to get, obviously, Kenobi, you'll have the series coming out the next day, the first two episodes. But we're going to get, I think, our first trailer for Andor. Um, maybe you get formal announcements of like the Kevin Feige Star Wars project. Like these are the things where you would get um, the real updates. You could also get, um, you know, Mandalorian season three wrapped filming uh, the other day. Maybe you get a teaser for that. Um, Ashoka we know was out there. So there's all these things that you could get confirmations, teasers, footage, new projects, but Star Wars is getting its own day. And it's, it's as I said, it's a Star Wars weekend, Memorial weekend, that's time honored. So um, pretty, pretty exciting. But I think we'll get a lot of news and a lot of cleanup 
of kind of the rumor mill that we've been we've been kind of hearing about Star Wars in the last you know kind of year plus. Yeah. Hey, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing what other projects they got, man. Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of uh, Star Wars fans out there that are really um, looking forward to seeing Kenobi and all those Star Wars shows that they have coming out, man. Um, and now, apparently, I, when they say post-credits, I don't know if they mean in each episode there's going to be a post-credit or the final episode will have a post-credit. So uh, they're reportedly um, doing post-credit scenes for the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Your thoughts on that and how you think that's going to play out? So the story I read was actually it was coming with the second episode. So that would imply that that might explain why on May 27th you're getting two episodes instead of one. Got it. Because what I read was in the post credit, the spoiler potentially, the post credit scene of episode two would be where Hayden Christensen appears. Okay. And that I think Deborah Chow said you will not be getting fully formed Vader in this series, which would explain one of the things that we were debating, which is how is Hayden Christensen actually going to come back in this show physically or vocally? Mm -hmm. um, but supposedly that may imply you see kind of Vader as still part human, you know, maybe like in the back of the tank or like without the helmet at times. And so you hear his actual voice and Hayden Christensen actually has a part to play outside of just the suit. Makes sense. But when he's in the suit, is that's the that's the curiosity curiosity that I have. When I like he's your, in the I like suit, that, I like your idea that like the that Tony Stark heads up display. I like that idea. Yeah, do. yeah. That, that it'll be interesting to see what they do with this man because everybody's uh, very much um, uh, excited and curious as to how they're going to pull this off and what we're going to see and how how is Christian going to be portrayed like if, when we do see him and how he's going to sound so there's a lot of uh interesting little tidbits there to look forward to when we do get this show um let us know in the comic section below what you guys think of uh the, pro the star wars projects coming out um announcements um and possibilities of what they what they'll show us and uh and the the Kenobi stuff, the post credit scenes and Hayden Christian, that whole deal we've been talking about for quite some time now. Uh, and it is almost here. And last and not, but not least, the show that everybody pr pretty much been talking about, Brian. Like I haven't seen this much uh, excitement over a show. Everybody who I speak to, yo, when that was dope, when that was dope. We get the second episode. Brian, we talked about a little bit about this um, via text. You asked me, what did I think? And what I thought is that we still got some great performances, some interesting dialogue. But uh, I was, I wasn't disappointed. Pointed, I would say I was just hoping for seeing Mark Spector. It seems like if you haven't seen the second episode, but it seems like we're going to get this in the third episode and not. And so the expectation was to see Mark Spector in the, in the second episode. We got a sort of mix of the two. Um, what were your thoughts on this episode, Brian? I agree. Um, I, I'm kind of into this show. Like it's it's holding my it's holding my attention. My attention. Um, yes. I think you know Oscar Isaac is making a play for an Emmy nomination. I think he's definitely he's definitely flexing his acting prowess. And as we see, Mark appear a little bit more juxtaposed with Steven, we're kind of seeing Oscar Isaac kind of give you the range. 
Ethan Hawke remains a little bit of an enigma to me, and I think that's by design. I like yeah. like what he's doing. Like it's mm -hmm. it's definitely got me intrigued. I really like the reveals in this episode, which I think work really well for a, a good villain, right? A villain who kind of has walked a mile in the hero's shoes mm -hmm. and has taken a different path. I, I always think that works great because that usually leads to a villain who believes what they're doing is right. Yeah. And might have some points. Yeah, yeah. Because especially as we're getting set up in this show, it's not a lot of virtue so far, right? Like Kanshu kind of seems like a, you know, pretty close to a villain and Amit see, doesn't really seem much better. And so like, yeah. we're definitely not in a world of, of light here. It's like dark and darker, right? That's yeah, kind of yeah. where, we're, where we're headed. And I think that's kind of cool. So I really like what Hawk did in terms of his kind of dropping knowledge uh, toward the end of this episode. It made me like, all right, we're, we're in motion on this character and I want to see where this goes. And I think the biggest thing this show is suffering so far actually has to do with the promotional material um, in the sense that I think everything, we, almost everything we've seen of Moon Knight, the, the actual costumed hero, we saw in the trailers. I think that's actually somewhat of an issue. I almost feel like at least one or two of these scenes would have felt cooler if we had not it's seen the them scene. before. Yeah, 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 I agree. So I feel like they're holding, what I feel like is being held back is when they flip the narrative, right? Because we are living this series as Stephen Grant with Mark Spector, and there's at least one other personality because Layla references another identity on the outside. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be shocked if we get through six episodes and they don't flip that to where at some point we are in Mark Spector's shoes and Steven is the outsider. And I think when that happens, this show will feel and look different because then the, the transformation into the costume Moon Knight will be the lead of the show as opposed to right now, it's the thing they're keeping off screen for the most part. So you're excited for episode three? I'm excited just because I feel like they've set up the perspective change. So I want to see where that goes. Yeah. I'm excited because like, I think one thing this episode was good at was by making Kanshu physical or at least sort of visible, it got them away from Venom a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Venom is a voice. And in the first episode, Kanshu was just a voice. And I was like, uh-oh. Yeah. There's a little yeah. bit of parallel here. Yeah. But seeing Kanshu more of the time made me feel like we're doing something a little, a little different, different in Mark's world. And that was kind of cool. I think the most important, or at least one of the most important episodes I'm looking forward to is how this all started. Because as you can see in the first episode, when he throws the, tape, the blue tape in the bucket, there's a bunch of them. So he's been doing stuff for quite some time. They do a good job of referencing um, like time passing. When Leda says, I've been trying to call you for months, uh, the blue tape in the, in the bucket, time has passed. It, uh, what I, I, I want to try to understand, how is Steven not gone crazy? Right? What has happened? Like, how did he get that date, that, that state date with this guy? How did that all come about? What personality was being used? Right? Was it, and one of the good, thing, uh, uh, good points John Campion's uh, show made was <clears throat> Mark Spector wouldn't have made that date with you. He's married. Or well, maybe he would have, but why would he make that date with you? Is there another identity that we don't know of? Because in the comics, he has a couple more. He has a couple more. And I said, Layla, re Layla references at least one more. Because when she cool. first encounters Layla, the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the wife, yeah. she says, Mark, is this your latest identity when she hears the accent? So she knows. Wasn't, but, it, she, but, she, but she didn't know it was Stephen Grant, though. She didn't, I don't think she knew no, Stephen Grant. But she knows someone else. She knows he's been someone else before. Okay. Because she definitely references, like, is this your latest secret identity? As a way to explain why Grant is so fish out of water and has that accent. 
So it implies that she has encountered another version of this character before. It's interesting. I haven't, you know, we all leading up to this show, there was a lot of discussion about the horror genre as it applied to this show. And like, there's kind of been like one scene in episode that's tried to do that. You know, we get like a darkened hallway and he's like running and he's scared. Like that's like horror stuff. But you know what, what you're describing and like what this is actually really seeming to draw on for inspiration is actually the Bourne series. Like okay. the born identity, right? Where like he goes to the bank. Every place he goes, everyone knows him. Every place he goes, <laughs> he's done something badass, right? But he doesn't know because he has he doesn't remember. A lot of this show is reminding me of that, like piecing together of key things that have already happened to your point in the passage of time. So, but you referenced the origin. I, I assume it's coming in episode three because we're going to Egypt, right? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, the yeah. point of that last shot is to be like, we're going back to where it began. And I yeah. think that's probably going to open this show up so I, they've definitely they definitely i was trying to think of like as as a a, a kind of a a brace of episodes one two together like you know we talked about like where would you have slot this in the rankings like where do you have this kind of relative to the other mcu shows after episode two like so one and two to, so if you're just comparing the episodes one and two of all the shows we've gotten, where is this show slotting so far? Um, <clears throat> Sloki is still number one. Yep. Um, Agreed. I think this would be the second. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. And, and I think the viewership would indicate that. I mean, the viewership for this has been bigger than pretty much anything except the WandaVision start, which I think was actually still the weakest, even though, you know, there was a purpose to it. Yeah. Um, and then and then Loki obviously has kind of far and away been their number one show. But this thing is kind of settling into that number three position. And I think it says people are interested in Hawk and Isaac and people are interested in seeing a new character on screen for the first time. So I'm kind of with you. Like, that's what I mean, like the show, it's not perfect. Yeah. But it's done enough that I'm like, I'm, I'm along for the ride. Like, I'm, I'm definitely getting invested in where, where we might be going. Yeah. Um, yeah. Question for you. Yeah. Arthur Harrow, Purple Magic. Do you think it's the same Purple Magic that Agatha was using? Like, Marvel's been pretty color conscious so far. Or do you think it's just coincidence that he, that purple's what they used? I think it's coincidence. Okay. I think it's coincidence. Okay. Yeah. I'd have to watch. I haven't watched any of the like new rock stars or these Easter egg stuff to sort of get any indication or understand what the connection is. But from what I can tell, it's, it's tough to say, but I, I think it's just coincidence. Okay. Because so far, like red has meant chaos, right? Like red was defined as chaos. The, uh, like Doctor Strange, Wong, they have that like yellowish orange color pretty consistently. The Eternals now have gold. That's like very consistent there. Yeah. But Agatha used purple and that was like dark hold related, right? It was sort of like dark world, dark dimension. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's, I don't I think it's a reach to say it's like the dark dimension, but like that seemed to be like the witch yeah. color. So when I saw that, I was like, am I supposed to think that Arthur Harrow is now somehow connected to the same forces that were powering Agatha? I don't know. It's possible. It's quite possible. But um, let's see, man. There's a uh, When this episode ended, I was like, damn, I, I, I need to see what happens with Mark Spector. <laughs> That's what I want to see now, you know? Yeah, I agree. But let's see, man. Uh... Last time I said um, I was going to cast an X-Men uh, character um, and I was going to do it in the beginning of the show. Um, I think I'll wait till we do the next show yeah. and I'll start off with that. Um, but it's, uh, I think Brian already mentioned one of the names earlier in the, on the, in the show about who I would cast. Um, for a specific character in the X-Men world, but uh, we'll talk, we'll lead off with that next time and we'll have a quick discussion about that. But that's our show for today. Um, please hit that like and subscribe button, hit that notification bell, share with your friends and we'll see you next time. Wait, Brian, any last words? 
Don't see Morbius. <laughs> that two yeah. hours of your life. That two hours of your life can go to better purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's our show for today. We'll see you next time on the Nerd Gym Report.